Hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening CIFL webinar. Um, I am delighted to welcome here today Dr. Joao Pedro Kuntaish, um, who will be talking to us about Article 17 of the new Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market, the DSM Directive, and the EU rules on online content sharing platforms that this provision sets up. Joao is a postdoctoral researcher and a lecturer at EVIA, the Institute for Information Law of the University of Amsterdam. And in fact, it is at EVIA that I first met Joao. Uh, we both wrote our PhDs at EVIA more or less in parallel. Um, it feels like that was yesterday, but I realized today, Joao, that it was over half a decade ago now. Um, Joao's doctoral research was on alternative compensation systems in EU copyright law, but since then Joao has expanded his areas of research. So among his other research interests, Joao has in recent years been working on questions related to the role and the responsibilities of online intermediaries, including those issues that are raised by Article 17 of the DSM Directive. Um, last year, I had the pleasure of working with Joao on a co-authored article, putting forward an alternative solution to the one that is set up by Article 17 to copyright infringement that occurs on online platforms. More recently, Joao has collaborated with Dr. Martin Husevec on the licensing mechanisms applicable in relation to Article 17. This indicates not only the breadth of the topics to which this provision gives rise, but also the depth of online's, uh, of Joao's knowledge of the area. So Joao, it is wonderful to have you here today. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christina. What a kind introduction, you know. It's really, really nice to be here. Oh, well, although I am in my living room, it is quite nice to, to be here. Uh, we miss you in Amsterdam, but now it feels like everyone is working from home. So just a general remark to I hope everyone is, is doing well and healthy. And so I'll try to, over the next uh, 35 minutes or so, discuss this very interesting and complex topic of Article 17 and the new rules on content sharing platforms. But what I am trying here to, okay. But first I have to, just a few preliminary remarks. Well, one important personal remark is that I am working from home and this is about the bedtime of my daughter. So I always feel necessary when I have these evening webinars to say that she is the queen of the apartment. And so you might, you might hear her speaking very loudly or screaming daddy or papa or a version of that. So I apologize for that, but there is really nothing I can do. This is her space and I'm just living in it. On a more serious and substantive topic, I think this is such a political uh, talk, uh, discussion that I feel the need to say what's my perspective on it, where I come from and what I'll try to do in this presentation, because there are a lot of heated discussions on this topic. So I do come from academia. I am involved in a number of projects that are publicly funded through the European Union and Horizon 2020 project on recreating Europe. I'm also with Christina, co-managing editor of the Clover Copyright blog, and I'm also editor of this uh, wonderful resource created by Martin Kretschmer and Olaf Frugal and their team at CREATE that tracks the developments of the CDSM Directive, the Copyright and Digital, Digital Single Market Directive. But I have not done particular studies or legal advices for any of the stakeholders interested in this debate, and I think this is important because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to be very clear about what I think is descriptive analysis, what I think the law tells us, and where I think there are reasonable doubts, and try to really make clear where I have some policy preferences. This obviously apart from my general normative preferences that are pervasive in my analysis, but I'll try to identify those so that we're not in a situation where people think I'm making certain claims just because I'm on this or that side of the debate. And I can, I'm happy to discuss this then in the Q&A afterwards. So having said this on the menu for today, I'll go quite quickly through a bunch of topics, but the idea is to give you a broad general vision of what this provision means, where how do we got here, the broader, con the broader context, how we got here, and then I'll dig into the mechanics of Article 17 and then discuss three issues with varying depths. The definition of online content sharing service providers, the authorization mechanisms and the nature of the right, and then this fundamental discussion between 
what are preventive measures and user versus user rights or freedoms. So onto the broader context, I think we have to understand the reality here is that Article 17 is just the tip of a broader iceberg, which we're discussing now, which is the Digital Services Act, which we want to be a refit of the e-commerce directive. So a lot of the solutions that you see coming up in Article 17 are part of a broader discussion initiated by the commission in 2016-17 on tackling illegal content online. And one of those categories there was IP rights, in particular, the copyright, as usual, takes the lead. But the major instrument in this area that we're currently negotiating is the Digital Services Act. So it, it, it is, I know this is very small on your screen, and I don't want you to squirt your eyes too much, but the idea is to, to, to put the CDSM directive, the Copyright in the Digital Cinema Market Directive, which is, I'd say, south of, of the line, of the timeline here, into some sort of context. And for you to understand, this doesn't appear out of nowhere. It is all almost in parallel to this commission efforts, a communication on illegal content online, a recommendation, both of them pushing for proactive measures by platforms vis-a-vis -vis illegal content uh, that then finds a corporization in the draft of the CDSM directive. But at the same time the CDSM directive comes in, there is at the lower of your graphic below this green box, you see that there's a very important challenge to the validity of certain provisions in Article 17, which is this challenge by Poland uh, against certain of these provisions based on freedom of expression. And as the, the process progresses, what you'll see is other instruments starting to take shape. So the terrorist content regulation is one of them. And in June and September of this year, you have the public consultation for the Digital Services Act. At the same time you have that consultation, you have a particular aspect of Article 17 that's being discussed by the Commission with a number of stakeholders. So Article 17 towards the end says, in order to better define certain of the mechanisms in this provision, we are going to carry out the stakeholder dialogues. This is the acronym SHD on the south in green in the graphic. And those are still ongoing. But in September of this year, so very recently, the European Commission, after the six stakeholder dialogue that took place, actually came out with a, let's call it a preliminary guidance, which they call the targeted consultation, which comes out with some ideas of how this should look. And this has now been commented very aggressively by different stakeholders and very passionately also. And right now we're in a hold pattern to see where the commission is gonna come down on. But as this is happening, other things are taking place that shape the discussion. So you see there, in July 2020, there's a very important advocate general opinion on the case, joint cases of uh, YouTube and Silando. I, I mentioned them as YouTube and Google. And right this week already on Tuesday, we had the CJEU hearing on the Poland versus Parliament case, uh, where this same advocate general is actually was actually there and he's going to issue an opinion on April 2021. This is important because it might indicate where it's going. So we'll discuss this a little bit later, but I want to mention to you, uh, already flag this, that this ruling is going to come out at about the same time that member states have to have their implementations done by the, as per the, the deadline of the implementation of the directive. So it's very much a hot topic, but also quite important decisions to be made by member states in this respect. Now, in light of this broader context, which I hope is clear and we can come back to it, how did we actually get here in the particular lane that is copyright? Well, there's a short story that is lobbying and politics. And here you can see the Yuri Committee, the Legal Services Committee of the European Parliament Rapporteur Axel Voss that pushed most of this, <laughs> this, uh, this, this provision forward. But I think there's a longer story that we need to look at. And the longer story, I think it's always nice to tell this in a certain narrative. So it's a, a fight between two different competing narratives. On the right shoulder side, pushing for stricter measures in this provision, there's the value gap narrative. And on the other side, there's the, the user right association, the upload filters narrative. And clearly at the end of the day, there's a prevalence of this value gap nature, right? You can see a meme here. And part of the discussion on the upload for, for the defenders of those that said that this provision is unacceptable because it imposes upload filters is that this would be a danger on the free and open internet. But on the other side, what you have is this very powerful narrative. And I have here an example of the record industry's representative body, the FBI, 
that basically what they do is they say, look, we have a problem here. We have a value gap between what the platforms are, the user upload platforms or so-called also user generated content platforms are paying versus what other online service providers are paying. And the example has always been YouTube as this terrible player that pays nothing for the content on their website versus the Spotify one. And I, I'm not here going to have economic discussions about whether or not there is a value gap. In my view, this has not been proven economically speaking. But I do think from the legal perspective, we really should look at this with a bit more attention. So what does this mean, this kind of narrative in this parallel between YouTube's and Spotify's? So I use this, my narrative device is whether we're comparing oranges and, uh, oranges and apples. And I've used this before, so those of you that have seen presentations from me before will recognize a lot of this here. So I would say that the, let's call the YouTube the orange and the Spotify the apple because there's a nice color scheme there. Let's start with Spotify. Spotify is actually an online music service provider. All of this pre DSM directive framework, talking about the legal framework, that basically intermediates in a way between the public and copyright holders. From the perspective of copyright holders, what they have to license to Spotify are authors' rights, a lot of them aggregated through collective management organizations, and then related rights, record producers and performers' rights, a lot of them aggregated in record producers. Now, obviously, the regimes that apply here are quite clear. On the, C, the collective rights management part, we have a specific directive that enable as a regime of multi-territorial licensing. That's the MTL acronym there. And the CRM is collective rights management directive. Apologies for all the acronyms. But on the side of the actual exclusive rights being licensed, these are a clear case of direct liability. It's reproduction and communication to the public under articles two and three of the InfoSoc directive. There is not a great doubt about the legal regime applying here. So this is a clear situation of an online music service provider, which would be directly liable unless it obtains licenses to exploit these exclusive rights, either individual licenses or collective licenses. Now, the case of YouTube is obviously different. YouTube is a user-generated content platform that intermediates between the public and the end user, but we have to understand what's the legal regime applying to it. Now, of course, the end user is here the one uploading. The copyright relevant act is the upload of the end user. This would be mostly, it can be also reproduction, but it's mostly about communication to the public. And in this particular case, it's very clear that the act of the end user is subject to primary liability, which is harmonized under the InfoSec Directive, Articles 2 and 3 and 4, but on line 2 and 3, talk about the rights of reproduction and communication to the public. Article 5 talks about exceptions and limitations, and then there's rules and enforcement for us, they're all relevant for copyright also in Article 8. So this is the, the setup for the user. But from the perspective of the platform is quite different, right? What we have is mostly harmonized regimes of secondary liability with partial harmonization in the e-commerce directive because they are considered hosting safe service providers and they benefit from a liability exemption, so-called immunity or safe harbor, coupled with a general ban on general, uh, with a ban on general monitoring obligations. So they are not subject to direct liability. They are subject to a regime that ends up being a notice and takedown regime. That's the MTD there. They're also subject to injunctive relief for content uploaded by the users. And member states are allowed to impose certain other obligations or duties under the guise of duties of care. This has led to a lot of these platforms of implementing variations of content recognition technologies. That's the CRT there. But that's not the same as what's happening for primary liability. It's a totally different regime. So there's more or less a clear line between those regimes as far as the law in the books is designed. Of course, there's, there's a lot of interpretation. The question has been, how do you monetize from the perspective of the rights holders uh, these uploads on platforms? And because the platforms operate under the shadow of a legal immunity or safe harbor, there's been a, a number of mechanisms to to monetize it. There's some licensing, some monetization through ad revenues and some other types of deals. And usually big rights holders have privileged access to the platform and they act as what's called or usually known as trusted flaggers. Now, this kind of setup is obviously tenuous, right? Because the line is not always clear. Now, it has become less clear in the relationship between platforms and rights holders as the Court of Justice of the European Union in interpreting the exclusive right of Article 3 of the InfoSoc Directive of Communication to the Public has slowly eroded what is traditionally a strict liability tour to, to 
introduce some mental elements. And this starts, well, it starts way back a little bit with Svetsen, but the main cases where this is explicit are GS Media, Film Spaler, and then the Pirate Bay. And there are a number of pending cases. The first two there in, in red are now joint cases that involve Google and YouTube. And also an Austrian case, the Pulse for TV, I think also involves YouTube, that are actually flat out asking the question that is present uh, that gave rise to the creation of Article 17 being, are these platforms directly liable for communicating to the public? So far, the answer has been no, but the line has been eroding. So they're close to the line, but the answer has been no. And there has been an AG, a very lengthy AG opinion I'll come back to from that advocate general I just mentioned that actually says, no, they are not liable. So as far as the law stands today, there is still that division despite the introduction, the introduction of these mental elements. This is important to note because we already see that there's a difference here, a clear difference between um, what the apple is and the orange are in my, in my analogy. Now, where are we specifically today? Well, we are today in a very complicated situation because as I showed you in the timeline before, we have the Court of Justice of the European Union trying to answer the question that gave rise to a legislative change. And so far the answer has been mostly no. We have the Polish challenge to Article 17 based on freedom of expression. Actually, that could invalidate key parts of the new regime. There was a hearing, as I mentioned, this Tuesday, and the ruling is going to come out at the same time as the deadline for implementation of the directive. There's the stakeholder dialogues under Article 1710, where there's a targeted consultation uh, that already gives more or less the idea of what the Commission wants to do about it, but we're still, most member states are in a hold pattern to, this, to decide how to implement this provision to see what the guidelines are. And then there are national transpositions that are starting to take shape, but in some cases, countries are, it's a sort of re regulatory competition to try to set out their, their position. And there you see, especially France pushing for a stricter implementation of the provision more strongly on the preventive measures in other countries like the Netherlands trying to, well, now the Netherlands, not in the first version, taking a different approach. At the, in the academic area, there's also a boom in scholarship. And I think I've been involved in a lot of it, actually pushing for a more user rights friendly and freedoms approach. Christina also, I would say on that side, and there's the European Copyright Society. And then there's a number, a number of stakeholders where I would put not just CMOs, right? So there's tech organizations, also the LIE to do its mixed nature with, with stakeholders and academics that push in different directions here. So this is where we are today, but probably will change next week. Now, with that setup in mind, so I gave you the broader context, and I also gave you a little bit of how we got here from a legal perspective and copyright. I will now explain the very, very complex mechanics of Article 17, and then go to the number of issues that I had mentioned before. Now, I really, I like to start with this uh, citation from Severine Dussolier's recent article on the Common Market Law Review, which calls Article 17 the monster provision, both by its size and hazardousness. She has always a very nice figurative uh, uh, writing, and basically focusing that, well, if you want to discuss legislative intent here, it's quite difficult in this directive, it was highly contested, but it is such a broad and complex provision that it actually opens up to a lot of interpretations. And that's both a blessing and a curse, as we'll see. Now, going through it, who does it apply to? Well, let me just push the dialogue box a little bit to the side. Well, it applies to online content sharing service providers. So whoever came up with this acronym really hates academics because we have to write it all the time. And what the provision does is both a positive definition, says this has to be a user upload content platform that hosts large amount of works, organizes and promotes them, and has to have a certain commercial and competitive effect. So clearly covering cases like YouTube and Vimeo, as video sharing platforms that are clearly covered. I'm going to come back to this because I think other so 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 considered or so-called obvious cases are not so obvious at all. And then it has a number of exclusions. And these are electronic communication service, business to business cloud service, online marketplaces, and so on and so forth. This is a combination of uh, examples that would fit in the positive definition and uh, examples of entities that lobbied sufficiently to be specifically excluded and then the legislated abstracted the category from the particular example. And obviously, nonprofit online encyclopedias is Wikipedia 
And the last one is clearly GitHub because they were quite involved in the discussion of the directive. I think they're rightfully excluded, but this is a bad way of doing law, I would, I would, uh, I would suggest. If you do not fit under the definition of OCSSP or you're excluded from it, you are considered a non-OCSSP platform. And that means that you're outside the scope of the directive and you are inside the scope of the previous regime I mentioned. So there is a bifurcation of legal regimes here. That means that we're going to have a lot of platforms that are gonna fall under this definition of this regime and platforms that are gonna fall outside of it and they're gonna coexist. And the question is, how does the previous case law and whatever case law continues from the court on that side, the, the prior, prior existing framework is gonna affect the case law in Article 17. So already see potential for trouble there. Okay, what is the what and how here? Well, if you do the, uh, fall under the definition of OCSSP, you are now communicating to the public. You are no longer an, an hosting service provider benefiting from it. So far you're communicating to the public independently of knowledge of the illegality of the upload. So there's a clear differentiation of legal regimes. This obviously means that there's direct liability, primary liability. The OCSSP becomes in a certain way a, a copyright user. Explicitly not benefiting from the hosting safe harbor in Article 14 of the e-commerce directive, meaning that it is, this is clearly less like specialist to the e-commerce directive. Now it will be, or the platform will be directly liable except if the following happens and now Please bear with me because this is quite complicated. I tried to make drawings, so it's a bit easier. So it will not be directly liable if option one, it obtains authorization. And I put this in quotation because authorization, as you will see, might mean many things from the rights holders. Now that authorization must cover the non-commercial uploads by its end users. So there's an extension effect actually in my view, there's a, a joint nature of the two, uh, of the two acts. So there's a, sh a shared sort of legal construct there. And I mentioned non-commercial as a shorthand because what the law says, or can be commercial, but without generating significant revenue. So it's sort of priced into the license. So that's option one. If you do not obtain authorization, then you go to what I would say in option two. And that's what the provision calls, or actually a recital calls it a liability exemption mechanism. And that's in Article 17.4, B and C. What we see there in the this option two is first that you have to have best efforts to obtain an authorization. So the regime says, if you obtain authorization, you're okay. But if you don't obtain authorization, the first cumulative condition is that you can add best efforts to obtain such an authorization. Now, there's obviously a link between these two concepts. And I think Sam Flavin and Metzger have really in the European Copyright Society actually very nicely put it as expressions of the same duty of the, the platform in this case. And what they say, it's very difficult to know what is best efforts are, but if there is proactive search of publicly known copyright holders, it's almost a sort of system of notice and action to license for others. So if it's publicly known, I have to go meet them. If it's not publicly known, then basically they have to notify me and I provide a license. And then these authors actually go into some sort of pre-contractual obligation system there. But I think the essence here is it's a fuzzy concept that's difficult to pin down and the directive doesn't say much about it, but you must comply with it because it's a cumulative condition. Now there are two more, right? So you didn't obtain an authorization, you prove best efforts. In addition, you have to carry out best efforts to ensure unavailability of specific works for which copyright holders provided relevant and necessary information. This is what's colloquially known as an obligation to implement upload filters and, and act expeditiously subsequent to a notice from copyright holders to take down. So it's basically back to the notice and take down regime, infringing content, and in addition, make best efforts to present its future upload. So that's basically what could be said, a notice and stay down regime, right? You received a notice, you took down and forever, then you have to filter or include an automatic recognition system that doesn't allow it to be uploaded again. And this notice and stay down is what's colloquially known as re-upload filter. So, so just we're clear on how these terms are usually used. Now. If you do all of this, this is one side. So this is the licensing and the um, preventive measure side of the provision, but then the provision has a whole second part to it. In the second part, we can call them mitigation measures or they're quite more than that. 
and you have proportionality assessment and factors for all the stuff that's most of the stuff that's above. You have a special regime for small and new platforms, which is mostly window dressing because one of the requirements is that the platform is not more than three years old. So if you're a new platform trying to get venture capital after one year and a half, you probably already have to start complying with the stuff. So no one's going to give you money for it. And then you have a, a number of other more relevant stuff, which is a provision on mandatory exceptions and limitations that makes them similar to user rights in 17.7 and coupled with 17.9. There's a ban on general monitoring in 17.8. And there's a number of what I would call procedural safeguards about complaint and redress mechanisms. Now, this is all very complicated. I won't focus on all of them, but if you want to know more about the part on the ban on general monitoring, you really should read Christina's and uh, Martin Semflevin's very, very recent study where mainly the main conclusion, Christina, forgive me, I went there and I put a tweet of yours there, <laughs> is that, uh, well, basically you have to be consistent between the ban on general monitoring in the e-commerce directive article 15 and this new ban and you have to prospectively be, be consistent in the new digital services act so here you also see the importance of the copyright directive as a sort of trojan horse or precursor for what's to come depending on your perspective and also what christina and martin say is that other preventive me measures may be required by intermediaries but certainly not the type of filtering provisions and systems that we've been talking about so far so i think in the q a we can get into that but i would highly recommend that you read this study now what I will talk about a bit later is about the user rights part and the safeguards, namely in one of the issues that I address. So, but hopefully by now, I know this is quite complex and hopefully it's clear different mechanisms of the, of, of the provision. Now, in sum, this is, I think, what Article 17 is, is a, mis a mix between the, the apple and the, and the orange in my analogy, sort of legal hybrid. And I think this legal hybridity of it comes with some serious uh, um, consequences for how it has to be interpreted and implemented down the line. What I think it's pretty clear is that there's a normative hierarchy in the provision that puts at a higher level licensing and on the other hand user rights or freedoms as the main goals and obligations of the directive and preventive measures at the lower level. And this is what Martin Semflevin is in a different article called this Bermuda Triangle between licensing for authors, the liability exemption mechanism, and preventive measures for um, platforms and the user rights of freedoms for users. But it also comes out very clear in the, in the arguments in the hearing last Tuesday in the, by the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council, and also the targeted consultation that just said a very simple thing we've been saying for a while, which is, if you read the provision on its face, there is an obligation of best efforts for the preventive measures. And there's an obligation of result for the provisions on mandatory exceptions and limitations. And one is clearly stronger than the other from the perspective of normative hierarchy. And from that perspective, when you're implementing the provision, you can't ignore that reality. Now, moving forward to the different issues that are, that are uh, here important. Now, very quickly, First is an elephant in the room. What is an online content sharing service provider? I won't go very deeply. These are my thought provocations for the discussion, but I think it's very clear that YouTube and Vimeo are there, but some authors have argued that Facebook wouldn't be there and other social networking websites wouldn't be there because they're not necessarily fulfilling the same requirements of the positive definition and the, with the assistance of the recitals that would lead you to the conclusion that their main function is to organize and promote copyrighted protected materials. Their main function would lie elsewhere. Their main competitive effect would also lie elsewhere. Now, I'm not saying this is correct or not, but I am saying that because of this open definition, there's a case by case analysis. I'll leave the citation here for those who want to then read the slides, I'll make them available. But I think the point here is quite a serious point. If you do a case by case assessment, it is possible that depending on how you implement these factors, that some of platforms that we, we would think that would fit this definition because they do host even large amounts of copyright protected content might not fit the definition. And certainly as you go down the line from the bigger platforms, doubts start to creep in about some of these sharing websites. So that's one point that's important. Now, something I will dig a little bit deeper into is about authorization. And I think the question here is, what's actually the nature of the right in Article 17? 
Well, I have a very lengthy and uh, quite boring article written with Martin Sinflay that should come out of peer review very soon, but I think it's an important point because what we do is we actually look at the different options of interpretation and we see four possible options. This is a set type of communication to the public within the minimum standards of international law. This is a subtype of copy communication to the public outside those minimum standards. It's a special right of communication to the public or a new sweet generous right of communication to the public. So in this first option, you would just, it would look something like this. It's everything fits neatly in the international minimum standards. Article three of the InfoSoft directive is basically an implementation and it's within that scope and article 17 would be a subtype of that communication to the public. Well, this is clearly not the case because a lot of things that fit currently after the case law of the courts in Svensson in linking and film spoiler and others would not fit in the definition or the concept of communication to the public in Article 8 in my view. And I think most commentators that have looked at this seriously would have said the same. So I'll, I'll move up from that. The second option, which is option B, is actually a little bit different. It, it posits that the European standard has gone beyond the min international minimum standard. This is what this image tries to show. But actually, Article 17 is squarely or fully inside the scope of Article 3 of the InfoSoc Directive. And I think our argument here is, there's a lot of arguments here, but that is actually not the case because the current interpretation of Article 3 of the InfoSoc Directive in all those cases I mentioned does not go as far as to cover clearly these hosting platforms that we're talking about. But more than that, the own construction of the right in Article 17 is such that it puts it outside the requirements that have been, let's say, creatively invented by the court to interpret Article 3. So it just really doesn't fit, even if you think it overlaps partially, which I grant it really doesn't fit. So our actual preferred interpretations are then, oh, Sorry, I have lost control of my presentation. <laughs> so I have to share screen again. Uh, do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Okay, let's see if this works. Do you see Christina, apologies, my whole presentation or the, cool, thank you. So I was going with this option B is really not convincing. So what we think is this is either a special right or a new sui generis right. The special right will be just basically qualification of like specialists saying, well, it actually would fit into the type of activities that are already covered by Article 3, but the specificity in the regime means that it is a, its own regime. So it doesn't follow, it's carved out from the InfoSoc Directive and it follows its own rules, which has some serious implications also. Uh, so the arguments there, we don't need to go through those, but the last part is that it's actually a new switch generates right. So something completely different created a new outside the regime of Article 3. These are different activities. They were covered by the safe harbor and now they're fully outside with their own regime. Now, my main point here, sorry to go through this, my, our view is that this is something between option C and options D. And actually it's also sort of what's endorsed by the Africa general opinion on Google YouTube, although obviously not exactly what we're saying, but also partially endorsed by the AC targeted consent consultation, which calls it a leg specialist. And you would say, okay, Jean, that's really, really nice. I like all those nice designs and things, but why does it actually matter all of this? Well, it matters because if you accept that it is an exclusive right within the scope of Article 3, so the first two options, what you have here is only certain number of possibilities of implementation of direct licensing, voluntary collective management, or collective licensing with extended effect. And those are the different options that are accessible to member states. And they're not really very satisfying in terms of making it operational. If you accept the other option that you see below, which is now faded, but I'll go back a little bit and follow our interpretation, you actually can potentially even talk about having exceptions and limitations to part of these activities in this idea that one size does not fit all. And for certain sectors, it will give you more possibilities of implementation. So that's broad strokes the argument. Now, very quickly to preventive measures versus user rights or freedoms, which is a very, very hot topic. Now, going back to our schematics is you didn't get authorization. You have best efforts to obtain authorization. So you comply with 17.4a and then you apply preventive measures. Now, the idea is that 
you, how do you apply these preventive measures? The only thing we've seen so far is that the, the offers out there are filtering mechanisms, so content recognition technologies that would apply the so-called upload filters or re-upload filters. But these are not suited for the types of uses that are permitted by or that are aimed by uh, Article 177, those user rights and freedoms that I told you are at a higher hierarchical level. So not only for all these reasons that I list here, but practically this, there is a contextual nature to a lot of these users that admittedly by all these companies, this, this type of technology is not attuned to. So what's going to happen is that if you do implement this type of measures, you will encroach upon Article 177, those user rights or freedoms. So how do you deal with this situation? Well, there is one approach, which is basically say, well, you know, we just put the filters on. This is the first version of the, the Dutch draft. That's why I call it NLV1 approach. We put the filters and all that is sufficient is to have a complaint and redress mechanism. And then users can actually complain. And if they complain and the, and the stuff is actually covered by an exception, then we're all good. Well, this is really not satisfactory because what that means is de facto, these uses will be blocked. And that will put actually the preventive measures as more, more important and more relevant in this hierarchical structure than the user rights. So it's actually inconsistent and, and not proportional. And it would end up, I think that's also Christina's and Martin's conclusion in their study, to imply a sort of ban on general monitoring that's actually prohibited by the, the provision itself. Now, the one way, one possibility, what we have to explore is how do we make sure that these user rights of freedoms prevail in the schematics of the implementation over the preventive measures. So how do we do this? Well, one approach, don't get scared, you don't have to read all of this, is what we proposed in a recommendation signed by about uh, 60 European academics, is how do we construct a system based on the case law that we have that allows this? So the important part is really here, right? Building on the case law and also the recent Facebook uh, case uh, on defamation, what we try to, to find is a solution that says, well, what can you actually filter? Well, you can filter either total matches of, of files or equivalent, because it's something that actually, unfortunately, the court has recognized for these cases. And those, you would actually have a blocking rule implemented. But if it's not one of those cases, actually during the complaint and redress mechanism that applies, that content would have to be left up. So we, there's a number of mechanisms to do that. One is flagging lawful uses. And if you do that, perhaps there's a chance that the provision is valid. But that would mean actually a change in the types of systems that platforms are using now. It's not a complicated change, I think, but it is a different type of approach. Now, this has been opposed very, very strongly by rights holders organizations on arguments that the harm that comes from this is much greater for rights holders than applying a de facto filtering system would pose a harm for users. Now, Coming back, and I promise this is my last slide, Christina, to the current discussion. This same mechanism that I mentioned now is actually a variation of it is what the targeted consultation from the commission is proposing. They just call it something else. They call it uh, either manifestly infringing, I believe, or partially infringing. In manifestly infringement, you can filter, partially infringing not. But we have a problem here, and the problem is the following. This is precisely what was discussed discussed in the hearing on Tuesday with the court on the Polish challenge to Article 17. And it's the focus of the challenge. The focus of the challenge is the fundamental uh, freedom of expression concerns with the preventive measures that I just explained. So member states are in a bit of a complicated situation. The AG opinion comes out in April 2021, and the decision will come out in the summer. In the meantime, they will get the, the guidelines from the commission and they have to implement the provision. So what do they do then if they do an implementation that then the court later on comes to say, oh, actually that's invalid and you have to change the law immediately again. So I would say we have a lot of fun times ahead for this, but uh, I hope at least I managed to provide some sort of some clarity on the topic. So thank you very much for your attention.